Um, uh, um, um, so I've gotten uh, 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 uh. Okay, so good afternoon. As you probably already know, today I am going to talk about uh, some of the topics included in my latest book. The title of the book is uh, Exit Reality. The English edition just came out, but the Italian one came out last September. The book, as you can probably guess by the subtitle that says Vaporwave, Backrooms, Weirdcore and Other Landscapes uh, Beyond the Threshold, the book is an investigation on the so-called internet aesthetics. And it is like my personal attempt to describe, analyze, and also maybe interpret a little bit a series of um, cultural artifacts that I've been observing online for more than a decade now. Um, so internet aesthetics are a very complex phenomenon and the speed at which they appear, they change, they evolve, sometimes they even disappear makes it very difficult to describe them exactly, to pin them down. Uh, but I decided to, to try nonetheless, because I think that they have, they deserve attention. They have a lot of cultural relevance um, because they, I think they are um, capable to say something about ourselves and about the way we see the world. Uh, they are um, created collectively by, and spontaneously by millions of people around the world. And so they are maybe one of the most um, reliable um, expressions of the zeitgeist, like the spirit of our time in a way. So I think that the best uh, thing to do would be to try to give a simple definition of what an internet aesthetic is or might be. And maybe we can start by reading the definition that has been proposed by a website that is called the Aesthetics Wiki. The Aesthetics Wiki is the Wikipedia of Internet Aesthetics and is a catalog. Like it, it aims to be a catalog of these cultural products. It is a, an, a collaborative project and was launched for the first time in 2018, but really took off in 2020 during the first COVID-19 lockdown. According to the official data released by uh, the company that runs the platform, that is called Fandom, uh, there are uh, more than 250 contributors and they're really young because 57% uh, uh, of the site's users are aged between 18 and 24. So the community uh, around these phenomenons is, uh, tends to be really young. Uh, this is the definition that you can read on the website. It says aesthetics have now come to mean a collection of images, colors, objects, music, and writings that creates a specific emotion, purpose, and community. There is currently no dictionary definition that captures the complexity of this phenomenon, which arose in the internet youth. So there are, I think, four main like takeaways here. First of all, internet aesthetics are multimedia, are a multimedia phenomenon and a complex one. Uh, so they include images, sounds, text, objects of very different nature, and they're aim that the, the, the main goal of internet aesthetics is to create a specific emotion. So the stress is on feelings, moods, vibes. They want you to, uh, it, it's content that want to make you feel things. It's, it's not much about how they look, it's about how they make you feel. And another important thing here is that they are produced by uh, young people, organized in communities uh, on the internet and through the internet. On the website, the entries are organized uh, alphabetically, but the content can be also browsed by e, by color, for example, or by decade or, uh, or uh, by image. But the most in interesting, I think, category uh, in the website is the suffix category. And today, the most frequently used suffix is core, followed by academia, punk, wave, and goth. So since it's, I think, impossible to like synthesize the entire book in half an hour, like because the lecture would turn into a boring list of things, I decided, as Yanis was saying in the introduction, to focus on a specific aspect of uh, the investigation. I will mainly talk about the topic of space, which is a very important one. You know, the book talks a lot about um, how we perceive reality and so time and space are the most like important like coordinates 
uh, in our uh, like when it comes to perceiving reality and inhabiting reality, how you perceive time and how you perceive space is really important. Uh, I would start by making a simple like, observation, which I think it's relevant. So since the early years of computing and especially the early years of the web, we have been using a lot of spatial metaphors to talk about what happens on the screen, right? And beyond the screen. So we have been placing icons uh, that resemble real objects on our desktops, transforming like a flat surface into a virtually endless office. But we have also been using words like cyberspace, information superhighway to talk about computer networks. We have been chatting in chat rooms or surfing the internet, visiting websites. Um, and so this habit of using spatial metaphors has been, of course, widely discussed. There's a giant literature on this topic. So sociologists, philosophers, media scholars have been talking about this, and they all have highlighted um, the fundamental role that metaphors have in making sense of technological progress. And in this case, they were helpful to kind of help us understand new social contexts and to help us maybe adapt to a new ecosystem. For example, this is a very interesting resource about the topic of internet metaphors. Annette and Markham, she wrote uh, a lot about this, and she describes this phenomenon very well when she writes, although computer-mediated social spaces have no literal physical substance, they can be perceived as having dimension, comprising meaningful structure places where things happen that have genuine consequences. So in this frame, the internet is no much a prosthetic for the senses, but a separate environment where the self can interact, move, travel, and exist. So conceptualized as a space, the internet develops architectures, boundaries, and multiple entry and exit points. If we look back at the early 90s, so the first uh, years of the web, the cyberspace, you know, the term coined by William Gibson, the well-known sci-fi writer, the cyberspace was perceived as a completely separate dimension. So it was this imagined as a interconnected digital environment that humans could populate using their minds while like kind of leaving their physical bodies behind. Right. And so this dichotomy between the incorporeal dimension of the web and the material world was so clear at the time that there was even like a corresponding term that was used to to like in, in contraposition with cyberspace, human bodies were trapped in the mid space. This is what like the, the body space was referred to as. But in the following decades, of course, the Internet changed a lot. It kept expanding. The number of its users grew exponentially. And so the whole experience of being online changed. Um, Thanks to, of course, the introduction of wireless connections, cheaper wireless connections, and most importantly, the adoption of smartphones, so mobile connectivity. So this thing had the effect of building a permanent bridge between these two dimensions, right? So slowly, what we used to describe as internet culture and the cyberspace became just culture. And this like clear-cut distinction between online and offline began to sound outdated to most people. And this is, for example, a screenshot from a documentary about the trial against the Pirate Bay. The Pirate Bay is a well-known file sharing site. And they were, of course, under trial for piracy. And during the trial in 2009, the lawyers addressed uh, Peter Sunde, one of the founding members, uh, with this word. Uh, he asked, uh, when did you first meet IRL? Uh, IRL means in real life. And the answer was really significant, and you can read it uh, on, on the slide. And, it, and I think it kind of explains a little bit this change of perspective that was happening. He answered, we don't use the expression IRL. Uh, we prefer AFK, which means away from keyboard, because we think the internet is real. So this kind of clear-cut distinction between these two worlds was kind of blurring. So the need to abandon this dichotomy, even linguistically, of course, has been then reiterated by a lot of other people in the following years, especially among the younger generation, because now the web is a constant. It's like a taken-for-granted kind of component of most people's lives. 
And also we learned at our own expenses that what happens online has always repercussions on the so-called uh, real life. But despite this newly gained awareness, despite all these changes, and also despite the attempts to recompose this fracture between our bodies and our minds, for example, using um, extended reality devices, uh, our meat dimension, like the meat space, the meat dimension is still, if you think about it, is still largely left out. Like using the internet is still very much like it was in the 90s, a disembodied experience, like mo most of your body is left outside. So it's important to talk about the relationship between space and memory, because we are um, extremely frustrated by this impossibility of merging the two dimension. And this dissatisfaction, uh, I think that emerges from our unconscious minds uh, in different ways. Because space, we all know that space is not like an optional dimension for human beings. Like our body lives in space, we are bodies, uh, we, we don't live inside bodies, we are bodies. So we uh, think about ourselves in space. Uh, and every single memory, this is why I'm talking about memory, every single memory that we store is a union of different dimensions. Like we, it is formed by a what, a when, and a where. And while we often forget about time, like we sometimes wonder when did this happen? Like we get, get confused about time or we can distort memories. We can rearrange facts a little bit with our memory, but it's, we, we very rarely lose track of the space, like the spatial coordinates. We know where something happened. Our memories are stored in space. This is uh, an image from an imaginary video game, this doesn't exist, called a Memory Simulator. It can be contextualized in one of those internet aesthetics I was referring at the beginning called Weird Core. It talks about a lot about dreams and it's, it, the atmospheres are very surreal. And here you can see this imaginary memory simulator shows us a playground. It is unknown from what year this memory originates, but the space is there. Like the exact image of the space is like impressed in our minds and we can forget other things. In the book, I quote Gaston Bachelard. He is a very famous French philosopher and he wrote this amazing a book called The Poetic of Space in 1958. And he says that memories are stronger when they are associated with specific places. And uh, I won't read the entire quote, but there's the last part when he says memories are motionless and the more securely they are fixed in space, the sounder they are. And he also says that the finest specimens of duration are kind of concretized. I think about space and places as containers for images. This is how I think we can think about it. So space captures the essence of time like a an insect in amber. This is another image that we can contextualize in the weird core aesthetic. And here you can see that uh, it says you can easily return to the past, but no one is there anymore. If we could really go there, those containers, we will find them empty because they are like left behind. Uh, so we are frustrated by this idea of not being able to bring the body inside the online world. But this gateway to this world, open world of possibilities is always visible and is always somehow accessible through the screens of our devices. So we try to squeeze the meat into the matrix in a way. Yeah, we try to kind of make up for this absence. And so we've, and how we do it, we, we, we devise tactics, like compensating tactics to try to make up for the absence of most of our like physical substance. The first tactic that I observed online is, you know that, right? Yeah, this is ASMR, right? <laughs> ASMR is a practice that uh, first appeared around 2010 on the internet and quickly became like a pillar of internet culture. Like ASMR is everywhere. Like it really like conquered internet culture uh, very rapidly and, and very widely. And ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. And despite its scientific sounding name, it's entirely empirical. Like there's nothing really scientific about it. And people just 
gathered around this sensation and they began talking about it and then they gave a name to it and then they are trying to uh, like trigger that sensation with different strategies. So ASMR artists, they whisper, they pour liquids, they rub things together and all these actions and especially the sounds that this action produce, they trigger a sensory pleasure that is supposed to calm your nervous system or to trigger a sensation that um, has been described as a brain gasm. You know that everything that goes on the internet at some point becomes really weird. Like, so you start just rubbing things on the microphone and just, I don't know, using slime and pouring things and then you end up doing ASMR with guns. Um, and there are a lot of different weird like interpretation of the same concept. There is ASMR that is food related, it's only centered on makeup tutorials, but, if, but also, yeah, um, weird versions like uh, that involves the use of bullets and firearms. Uh, this has, if you look it up, this has a lot of views, like an incredible uh, amount of views. And another very popular kind of internet content that uh, I think we use to kind of, again, bring our bodily sensation uh, into the experience of the web is the genre of ambience videos that is profoundly connected with ASMR. And this is uh, a YouTube video genre that involves recreating very specific audiovisual atmospheres. I don't know, a crowded bar with soft music playing in the background or um, a Scottish castle on a windy night or maybe a spaceship where you can imagine being like just lie down on the bed and just uh, relax and fall asleep. So even though ASMR is like embedded into these kind of videos, the focus here is not only on the senses, is also on your imagination. So they are made to make your mind travel elsewhere. So it's a kind of uh, very uh, rudimental kind of um, time, tra time travel or space travel. It's about, again, transferring your mind elsewhere. But the discourse on the body cannot be just reduced to sensory stimulation, which is what I have been talking about so far. We also need to talk about self-representation online. So we cannot bring the body in, but we can use our body to communicate, like using our screens. So for example, when you scroll on apps like Instagram or TikTok, what you see is just this endless stream of mediated flesh. You see a lot of flesh, a lot of bodies, a lot of, uh, um, uh, faces, expression. So we try to overcome the threshold of the screen using the body, which is the oldest interface that we have to kind of convey emotion and the one that works the best so far. Finally, this idea of being online, but also like this split state of present of being in two different places at the same time. So in this room and on the internet at the same time, is also present in the context of virtual reality. In that specific context, for example, this is an image from VRChat, every interaction that happens occur in a sensory hybrid state because the, the track body um, leaves, I mean, it, it exists in, the, in your living room, but also the digital avatar mirrors your body on the other side. So it's a hybrid kind of split state of present. And it's a liminal state. We are going to use the word liminal a lot in the next few minutes. So let's talk about what liminality is. Liminality is another key word um, of the book. Uh, I talk about liminal places, states, emotions a lot. And this topic of being between two worlds, with being between two different dimensions, is a recurring one in all the internet aesthetic. Like, you know, the main internet aesthetics, it was present in Vaporwave, you can find it in Weirdcore, Dreamcore, and a lot of other um, in the liminal space aesthetics and so on. So this image of the threshold is omnipresent in the context of internet aesthetics. We are talking a lot about these places that are not here nor there. But liminality is not only about the frustration of being split. So it's not just about being like sort of invited into a world that we can only partially access. Liminality in internet aesthetics is also about 
um, the idea of representing the precariousness of contemporary life. It's about uh, trying to find a way to represent our deep insecurities about the future. It's about trying to cope with a lot of unfulfilled promises of capitalism and of technological progress and of trying to cope with the present in which we feel stuck. This is uh, another important part of it. Uh, so we, a lot of people feel trapped in this kind of continuous present, like, like a corridor with no perceptible end in sight. And of course, living on the threshold also means having a, different percent, a, diff, a very different perception of time. Time feels looped. It feels like it's kind of not going anywhere, but just repeating itself. This is a very typical image of the vaporwave aesthetic. The vaporwave aesthetic is probably the first internet aesthetics in general, because it was born around 2009, 2010. And it was, it can be considered the first musical and visual style born and raised on the internet. Um, and two, these two topics that I was mentioning a minute ago, so being trapped in a time loop and also having to deal with this um, burden of broken promises, unfulfilled promises. These two ideas are very strong in Vaporwave. Also, the name is a reference to that. You know, the name Vaporwave is a play on the term vaporware. Uh, vaporware is an expression that is used in, in the tech industry to define a product that is announced but never actually brought to life, it never reaches the market. So it remains vapor. It remains like a marketing pitch, uh, a promise, and again, an unfulfilled promise, a hot hair, a puff of just a vapor, a cloud of vapor. So vaporwave, it's a play on vaporware. So it's about having to deal with a lot of promises that, of technology that never really came true. So you f we found a lot of imagery of empty molds, that have these aesthetics that refers to the late 80s, beginning of the 90s. So the mole is like the symbol, especially in the context of Western, especially North American culture, the mole is like the symbol of consumerism and all the promises that came with that. And so we find a lot of empty space that are dedicated to consumerism. And also vaporwave is the aesthetic that starts a persisting wave of nostalgia. Nostalgia is another keyword that you find a lot in the book. It's interesting because it's not just uh, being nostalgic about a specific moment in time. It's nostalgia as a constant mood about missing something. And sometimes you don't even know what you're missing exactly. Uh, we observe young people uh, that are nostalgic toward um, historical periods that they never knew. Like uh, they, they maybe feel nostalgic towards, I don't know, the 70s, the 80s, and they were born, I don't know, 15 years ago. So it's kind of a generic sentiment of loss, of displacement, right? Um, and so nostalgia kind of also becomes a way to um, trigger our imagination. And again, since we cannot like really teleport our bodies elsewhere, we travel with our minds. We kind of, we try to manipulate our consciousness to bring our minds elsewhere. This is a typical liminal space. And again, we have a definition from the aesthetics wiki. They are very precise in trying to define every single aesthetic. And the liminal space aesthetic is like a mother aesthetic. It's a very broad one. We can find liminal spaces in all the other aesthetics. The empty malls and the never-ending boulevards of vaporwave, they were already liminal spaces, what we now would call liminal spaces. Uh, as the definition says, uh, a liminal space is a location which is a transition between two other locations or states of being. And typically, these are abandoned and oftentimes empty. For example, a mall at 4 a.m. or a school hallway during summer. This makes it feel frozen and slightly unsettling, but also familiar to our minds. So liminal spaces are empty always, waiting rooms, stairs, underpasses, but sometimes also playgrounds, swimming pools, uh, parking lots. The atmosphere can vary. It can be like a vague sense of desolation, or it, they can trigger a general feeling of nostalgia, but sometimes also they can trigger a feeling of unease. They can be unsettling. This is Dreamcore. 
uh, as like if we want to give us a, a specific definition. And this concept of liminality has a specific origin. It comes from the world, um, from the the, uh, the field of anthropology. It was defined uh, for the first time in 1909 by a Belgian anthropologist. And then it was taken up uh, with a, ver a wider investigation in the 1960s by Victor Turner. And originally, liminality was not about space. It was, again, it, it was about a mental state. This is the definition that Turner gave in 1969. And he's, he wrote the liminal entities are neither here nor there. So again, we are between things. They are betwixt and between the positions assigned and arrayed by law, custom, convention, and ceremonial. And so at the end, he also says, liminality is frequently likened to death, to being in the womb, to invisibility, to darkness, to bisexuality, to the wilderness, and to an eclipse of the sun or moon. So the concept of liminality that we apply to liminal spaces now actually was coined to talk about liminal um, mental states. And liminality can also be described, and a lot of users do that, be described as a feeling of being on hold, like the experience of waiting for something that hasn't happened yet, or something that maybe might happen, but we don't know it yet. And according to a, an amazing book that is called The Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows uh, by John Koenig, which is a book that invents new words for new feelings, the sensation that we get from liminal space is should be called canopsia. This is an invented word. But this is very important because canopsia is the sensation that you have when you are confronted with a place that you normally see very crowded, but for any reason, you don't know why you see that place completely empty for the first time. This is the definition he says, the eerie, forlorn atmosphere of a place that's usually bustling with people, but is now abandoned and quiet school hallway in the evening, an unlit office on a weekend, vacant fairgrounds, an emotional after image that makes it seem not just empty, but hyper empty. So it's a different kind of emptiness. Uh, with a total population in the negative, who are so conspicuously absent that they glow like neon signs. So it's all about um, emptiness. And also, if you think about it, again, those are empty spaces left behind. Those are containers for memories that we have abandoned along the way. Um, an important thing that I would like to say that I haven't said uh, earlier is the fact that the book is, contains a lot of quotes that I collected on YouTube, Reddit, um, and 4chan and other websites. So I try to collect comments of the users uh, and to try to make the reader understand not only how these images look, but also which kind of sensation do they, they actually trigger. So this is one of those comments. Uh, Jess Lang on YouTube says, I feel like they are corpses. They used to be filled with life, movement and potential. Now they are just a dead body left behind as, leave, as life moves on. So liminal spaces also, they trigger, like maybe unconsciously, a series of questions. Uh, maybe you unconsciously ask yourself, where has, where has, has uh, everyone gone? Like, what made them disappear? What happened? Maybe, is, maybe this is what the world looks like when, we, when humanity is extinct. Like, when we, like, after us, the world after us, right? The last part of the talk, it's about glitching thresholds and infinite pools. Who knows what the image is? You know, you know? Yeah, don't be shy. <laughs> okay, those are the backrooms. Uh, the backrooms are one of the most popular like internet uh, mythologies of the recent past. Again, it's a liminal space. But the backrooms are like this infinite labyrinth of identical rooms with no end in sight. And it's a very anonymous kind of image, not very interesting in itself. But in 2009, an anonymous 4chan user posted this comment together uh, with the photograph. And the caption <laughs> began as follows. It says, if you're not careful and you no clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms. So no clipping is a term from, that comes from the world of gaming. And 
when it's activated, it allows the player to um, remove obstacles, basically to move in every direction, to uh, pass through walls, objects, even other players. Um, and sometimes if you venture a little bit too far or you find a glitch, you can even find yourself uh, beyond the boundaries of the virtual env environment and like maybe suspended in a sort of electronic uh, limbo out of the world on the other side of the game. So once again, you can maybe peek and find yourself beyond the threshold, uh, which is a very weird, interesting, but also terrifying experience, like to be able to actually go out of the world. And what happens is that when, if you think about it, when you, you match the concept of the threshold, with the concept of the no clip. If, if you think about the threshold as something that can glitch, you know that when something glitches, it tends to replicate itself. So if the threshold glitches, it becomes a space and, you, and you're trapped in that space. And so the threshold is not uh, something that you can just go through anymore. It's not a portal. It's a, a space that glitches and continues to self-generate in, in this never-ending loop. So we, again, we have the concept of the loop. So the, the fact that the backroom's lore describes this place as this vast space made of identical rooms hints that this place could be, for example, the result of a computer simulation, uh, a computer simulation that we lost control of. So this like endless replication of spaces also evokes fears of losing control of the technology and having maybe a computer that keeps generating space, that spaces that are not made for us. And in fact, the idea of finding yourself trapped in this unlimited, disjointed, nonsensical architectural structure is a concept that is very, like that has a lot of roots in contemporary culture. This is, for example, a very famous uh, manga series. It, it, the title is Blam. Uh, it was written and drawn by a Japanese artist. His name is Tutsomo Nihei. And in the book, he talks about this city that has been built by robots. And basically, I'm summing up the, the, the plot a little bit, but basically what happened is that humans were using robots to build the city, but at some point they lost control over the robots. And so the robots, they kept constructing things that are completely nonsensical and they end up trapping human beings. So these spaces are not made for human beings. They are trapping us and we are completely, like we have lost control of them. And there's this very obvious reference that I make in the book, but I think it's a useful one. Uh, like if we want to go back in time a little bit, we could connect this idea of an endless series of interconnected spaces to Borges' uh, Library of Babel, right? Which was a universe, which others called the library, composed of an indefinite, perhaps infinite number of hexagonal galleries. In the center of each gallery is a ventilation shaft bounded by a low railing. From any hexagon, one can see the floors above and below, one after another endlessly. Again, we have this idea of being confronted with a space that we can't really control and we don't know how and where and if it has an end. And there's a, also a specific uh, aesthetic connected with pools. It is called pool core. And this image is by Jared Pike. He uh, is a New York based artist. He is uh, specialized in 3D graphics. I mean, he's not the only one doing this kind of imagery, but the images that he made are the most popular. They are hugely popular. He started the series in 2021. And again, according to our Wikipedia of the aesthetics, pool core can suggest feelings of eeriness and serenity and peacefulness, but they, are also, they can also get creepy. You can have the same uh, reaction that you have with a, when you are confronted with a liminal space. We have another YouTube comment here. Brad Martin on YouTube says, I want to lay in every single one of these pools and fall into the abyss. <laughs> Pool core, in fact, has this natural connection to the dream world and to the unconscious world. I don't know, for example, like Jung talk about a lot about water as a symbol of our unconscious mind. This is a video, again, from Pike that can give you like a visual sensation of what, what I was talking about.
The conclusion is that the door won't open <laughs> because the screens of our devices, which represents this like dividing line between the physical and the digital world, are now like permanently open portals. And so if you think about it, the internet itself is a liminal space. Like when we connect, we are neither here nor there. If we want to use Victor Turner's words about what liminality actually is, or we can follow this meme that says the remote login is a lot like astral projection. It's about like uh, uh, being able to project your consciousness elsewhere. But there are a lot of images and memes that talks about this kind of separation. And we know web users are very accustomed to this kind of experience. It's not something weird for us. Like we don't really consciously feel the disconnection. But if we look at those images with with a little bit of more of attention, we can sense that there is a deep awareness of the fact that online life is still kind of split, that there's this dual nature, right? So this is, for example, a very famous meme called, this is where I post from. These are the kind of images that you can see in the memes, right? So the memes only appears to reveal what it's behind the scenes, like the mid dimension of the experience. But what it actually does is just to add another metaphorical level. The place where I post from is not a physical space. Again, it's a mental space, right? So, and we have also a variation. There's another meme that says mentally I'm here that does a similar thing. So again, it's about having your body in a place, your mind elsewhere, and maybe your mood in another, even in, in, in a third place. It's about being split. So the recurring image of the threshold does not spring from an attempt to maybe reinforce this dividing line. On the contrary, like I think that it expresses a very clear desire to reunite the two sides, to kind of try to find a connection between inside and out, between reality and simulation, between what happens on this side of the screen and the world of infinite possibilities that opens up on the other side. Uh, these, a world of possibilities and also a world of promises that keeps luring us in, but fosters a lot of frustration. For example, if you think about it, we would like to be able to manipulate matter as we manipulate content. We would like to, we dream of shaping our bodies as we shape our avatars. Uh, we would love to time travel, space travel instantly like we do in video games. Uh, we would like to live multiple lives and adventures like we do in video games. But as yet, we don't, we, we, but, but so far we have not managed to uh, do away with this threshold, to get rid of the threshold. And I think that this is why we dream about it. Like we keep representing the threshold, we keep talking about the threshold. And we also look uh, for new ways of inhabiting this space in which we kind of feel trapped. So the door is there for us to see, but it just won't open. Thank you. Oh.